to you all to our first virtual St. Patrick's Day celebration of food and music and good cheer. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we're not able to gather in the normal manners we have in previous years uh, uh, to celebrate uh, this. While it's St. Patrick's Day, we all know it's really St. Patrick's season. And uh, it's, an, it's a part of the year which involves many different events in the Irish Canadian community from coast to coast to coast, involving lunches and concerts and all sorts of celebrations of the arts in Canada. So um, we're very, very happy to welcome you all here this evening. And uh, we have a very exciting year ahead and a very full, exciting year ahead next year as well. Um, 24 years ago, the work began to create Ireland Park on Toronto's waterfront. And some 13 years ago, work began to create Dr. George Robert Grisset Park, which will open in the summer of this year. We have also secured the building beside Ireland Park and work will begin to renovate that building in July, sorry, in, in, in May and June of this year. And that will also open in, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the spring and summer of, uh, of 2022. So with this diversity of the activities of the foundation, uh, we are really no longer Ireland Park per se, or Grisset Park, we are really uh, an organization that embraces a much wider field of Irish Canadian uh, celebration. So uh, our board decided that it was really appropriate now to change the name from Ireland Park Foundation to the Canada Ireland Foundation which reflects the wide diversity of the interests of the foundation in celebrating so many different aspects of the, the involvement of people from the island of Ireland and Canada, and indeed of Canadians and the uh, uh, Canada's role in Irish history and, uh, and indeed currently uh, in business and in the arts. So um, I'm delighted that you're able to be with us tonight. Your boxes will show the new logo of the Canada Ireland Foundation. We've substituted the word park with the word Canada because we're a Canadian foundation. And so we think it's a, it's a great way for us to, to leap forward with the new a time change tonight. We'll be leaping forward to a, a, a new spring, a new summer, which hopefully will be an awful lot better than the one we had last year. And, uh, and of course also, uh, you know, to celebrate a new name. So uh, we are very excited about that. So in addition, you know, wonderful serendipity. Uh, uh, James Maloney, who's with us this evening, and Deirdre and family uh, have worked for five or six years to begin a process uh, to have the month of March named as an Irish Heritage Month. And um, we will have a link on our website, and I'm sure James will have it on his website, uh, of the text of a wonderful piece he wrote. Uh, which was uh, which he read out in the House of Commons in Ottawa late last year in the first reading of his bill, uh, which was passed unanimously on the ten on the tenth of uh, March this year, just last Wednesday, and it's a wonderful thing. So it really now it's official that St Patrick's Day is not one day; it's really a season. Uh, but in Canada, it'll be known as Irish Heritage Month. So it's a very exciting uh, companion development to our own aspirations to be uh, a foundation that celebrates Ireland, Ireland Park on the waterfront, Dr. George Robert Cassette Park, and also our new building on the waterfront to showcase the very best of, of Irish arts, music, food, of course, and, uh, and uh, excellent wines and, and whiskies and all sorts of other wonderful things that come from the island of Ireland and, and things that come from Canada and go to Ireland. So, um, really tonight has been made possible by great contributions from Donna Dura and her husband, Kevin, and from Owen Banks, who's here with us tonight, and uh, his cousin, Ethan Brian in England, from Salisbury, and Tom Power here in Toronto. So you're in for an evening of great food, um, uh, uh, great music, great voice, great singing, and it's, I think, as close as we can get to being all together. So I want to thank uh, all the members of our volunteer committee and programming committee, uh, Charmaine Lindsay, Mary, Mary, uh, Mary Margaret McMahon, and uh, all the other members of the committee, uh, uh, Connie Nicholson, who's doing great work to help William Pete 
And of course, William Pete is, you know, a tremendous resource to our foundation and constantly does great work. And to all the members of our board and all of our volunteers, we are a volunteer organization and none of this could happen without volunteers. So to Don, I now want to say I'm going to hand you over to Owen Banks, who's a master of culinary issues. And uh, thank you, Owen. And thank you all for coming tonight on virtually. And big hats off to you, James Maloney. Well done. And uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Robert. And it's uh, great to see you. I mean, it's been almost 12 months since we last uh, last met. That was in three dimensions. This is unfortunately in two dimensions. And hopefully we have the opportunity to uh, to connect again very soon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, do you leave a cordial air? I guess uh, welcome to a, a very strange St. Patrick's Week here in Toronto and around the world. I know many of our, uh, our Irish friends around the world are celebrating virtually. It's been an incredibly difficult 12 months for everyone, and uh, it's, it's great to be here with you this evening. Um, the, the work that Robert and the, all the team at the Canada Ireland Foundation do is, is an incredible celebration of all things Irish and all things, like as he said, to do with the Ireland of Ireland. It's not just about the, uh, about the food this evening, it's also about the music, it's also about our, our culture. Um, and the diaspora that spread around the world over the last 150 years and obviously made an indelible impact on so many countries, but especially the country that I'm now proud to call home. And I know Robert calls home as well and many of you others uh, here in Canada. So we have a wonderful evening ahead of us. I know you all got your box uh, this afternoon, or at least I hope you did, because otherwise you may go a little hungry. You'll be quite jealous of what we have. And you, you had a wonderful menu here. I know Chef Donna should be out there. I hope, I hope she's going to join me momentarily. Um, but she's created a wonderful evening with uh, her team at, at Mildred's Temple Kitchen, uh, which were dropped off this, this afternoon. I will confess I've already had my starter. Um, I didn't want to be eating on camera, so I had a wonderful cured whiskey cured salmon just a few moments ago, and I'm enjoying it with a glass of wine. I did struggle, Robert, to find some Irish wine. There is a producer in County Meath, believe it or not. I had a bottle of his wine last year, uh, a wonderful Merlot. But uh, obviously, we're known more for our whiskey and our beers on the island of Ireland and uh, really delighted to be able to, uh, to have a wonderful evening this evening with Donna's food and, of course, the, uh, the beer and wine and uh, spirits that we produce at home as well. Um, I don't know if Chef Donna is there because I do want to have a quick chat with her. I, hope, I wonder if she's busy in her kitchen. I'm here. Uh, oh, there she is. I, 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 can... I need the host to invite me in on the video. Oh. <laughs> Let me see, can I do that? I don't know, maybe you can do it. Maybe Robert, maybe William, <laughs> but I... There, there she go. is, Hello, great to everyone. see you, how, how are you? I'm well, Owen, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. good. Uh, great to see you, like I was just saying, I think the last time we were all together was just 12 months and maybe a handful of days ago and it's... Uh, been an incredible year and not in a positive way unfortunately um, we were talking a little bit earlier that you know hopefully we're starting to see light at the end of the tunnel but it's been an incredibly long tunnel and uh, so how has it been for you obviously our industry our food and beverage industry has been really impacted along with many other industries but uh, how, how have you been? Well, uh, Mildred's Temple Kitchen is holding its own. I'm not, it, it's been a challenge. I, I certainly am not going to gloss over that. Uh, but we've got a wonderful team, a small group, and they've hung in there. We call them the uh, recovery team, MTK recovery team. And they're working very hard and they were very excited that uh, we were able to participate tonight and cook a meal out of a box <laughs> because we've all learned how to uh, pivot the P word. The P word, that's it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's kind of, uh, it's been fun and challenging. Uh, I'm looking forward to the end of it, but we're getting there, Owen. We're getting for there. For sure. Yeah, yeah. And I know we mentioned earlier, I mean, it's uh, especially for independent restaurateurs. And I mean, I, I describe it as the travel meals and entertainment uh, section of our society has been really impacted. We haven't traveled like we would normally do. We haven't eaten like we normally do. We haven't entertained ourselves like we normally do. I, I'm sure many of us do have Zoom fatigue. It's a real thing. Um, and no better woman than yourself, a titan of our industry and, and such an inspiration to me and many others. Uh, you've been in this for so long. You've chaired and, and being the head of Restaurants Canada, you've really been an inspiration to us all. 
um, and you talk about grit and determination and, and how to, you know, really focus the industry. And our industry does need to adapt. It does need to change um, in so many ways. And it needed those changes before COVID. And, and now I think things things are, have been forced upon us in, in so many ways. But how do you see the recovery and the, the next few years going for the, the food service business? Well, I think um, one thing that I hear from our guests over and over again, Owen, is uh, I've learned through this pandemic that I can live without a lot, but I can't live without my restaurant or my local bar or pub. And uh, so I think we're going to see a lot of pent up demand for our services, which means we're going to have to really, you know, tighten our, <laughs> our seat belts and, and get at it, rebuild our teams, and get them excited. Uh, but I do think there is work to be done. Um, you know, we were talking earlier about J.P. McMahon and his uh, philosophy with Irish cuisine and uh, Irish agriculture. And I think there's some great uh, work happening, in, uh, particularly in Ireland with Bordbia. And I think Canada has a great opportunity to, to take some lessons from that. But um, I personally have taken away how much we waste in our food service operations. And I imagine that people who are spending more time at home in their kitchens are also discovering that, uh, you know, we, we probably need to manage the way we, we shop and we process or cook our food because we do see a tremendous amount of waste. <laughs> that's, that's very true. And I mean, I, I was so impressed with the package that you put together with your team uh, this afternoon. It's really, like I said, I've already had the salmon. I couldn't resist and I didn't want to start this evening on an empty stomach. Um, and like you said, I mean, I think so many similarities between the two countries you know, I sometimes I think uh, we Canadians don't back ourselves and, and really focus on the bounty of our own back door, especially in Ontario. I know, you know, we obviously have small seasons, especially with the climate that we have here and the same in Ireland. I mean, our our all of our uh, relationship with food is is incredibly uh, emotional. I would almost call it spiritual and like you now something that we've grown up with. I always tell people that you know, we need food and drink in order to sustain ourselves as a species. It's not simply something that we do for fun. It's also something that we require in order to, to get through the day. And, and you've had a, a long career. Like, so who are some of your inspirations? Like, what memories do you have that inspired you from an early age? Oh and God, what? It's so long ago, I can't remember. Um, well, of course, like every chef, you, you ask every chef, and they're going to tell you their mother or their grandmother inspired them. And, um, you know, I don't know about the next generations coming online. They may say, you know, I was inspired by my favorite restaurant down the street. Right. Uh, because we've lost that, uh, what I call the return to the table. And, uh, but, you know, myself being the oldest of six, uh, we spent a lot of time around the table. And uh, my grandmother, uh, my, on my father's side, my father is of Irish descent. Uh, she was a wonderful cook and very, very simple, but very uh, cared about the ingredients that she was cooking with. And you could feel the love in her cooking. You, you just always love to go and, and eat at her home. Uh, on my mother's side, my mother's Italian. Um, of course, the Italians, they love to spend a lot of time around the they table. They certainly do. And uh, so growing up and eating with family was very important. But then when I got out into the industry and I was, you know, like a lot of people, I, I started in the front of house and then I moved to the back of house because I was fascinated with what was going on in the kitchen. Um, you meet people along the way who inspire you. I, I will say I very, was very inspired by Julia Child as a young woman. And I had the great pleasure of meeting her numerous times over my career and actually cooking a, a dinner one night for her in a very small setting and, and getting to know her a little bit better. But she had such a wonderful attitude towards, again, ingredients, camaraderie, fun. You know, she didn't take it too seriously. And I think sometimes we go a little, we go a little off the deep end. Uh, very relaxed and genuine, and I, I love that about her. And my first uh, chef, who was a woman, and she was Italian. She studied cooking uh, professionally and uh, in in Italy, and she came to Canada, and she's still operating a restaurant in Ottawa. And uh, I learned a lot from Raffaella, and she was a very big mentor in my career as well. So 
Thank you, Rafaela, wherever you are right now. <laughs> Fantastic. And like you said, I think one of the things, hopefully that people will, will take a moment, even as a byproduct of this pandemic, is maybe to slow down just for a moment or, or take a few minutes. And one of the challenges in our society now is people not maybe having the time to prepare food like they do. Everything is based on time. It's a race. It's a race to get home. It's a race to get dinner on. It's a race to eat. Um, and I know like the explosion in, in uh, home cooking that people who may not have particularly had the time in the past, especially during the week, you know, sourdough became a thing in, in the spring, uh, the amount of baking that people are doing. We've obviously seen the impact on the dairy industry in Canada with the demands placed on that for, uh, for raw ingredients in the grocery stores. And um, is there any particular dishes or, or new recipes or techniques that you developed um, almost organically during the pandemic or were you I too busy? I think what I've done, and, and, and I hope we've reflected in this evening's meal, is we've gone back to very simple cooking and very easy cooking, because you know this, Owen, the three things, the most important things in cooking are the mise en place, which is the preparation, um, and timing and temperature. And I know when, I, uh, when I'm cooking or, or teaching people to cook in a, in a culinary setting, they always groan about, oh, I can never get everything to the, uh, uh, on time to the table or something is overcooked and something's undercooked. So tonight's menu, we really hope <laughs> that you'll cook along with us and, and I hope you were able to follow your instructions. We tried to keep it incredibly simple and flavorful because we want you to enjoy the evening. And, and I'll just tell you a little bit about the first course. I've gone yes. ahead and plated mine. Um, so that's the, uh, it's line caught organic Irish salmon and we cured it uh, with um, Irish whiskey, of course. <laughs> I, have a I have the half bottle here. There you uh, go. There you go. How much of that half bottle will be left at the end of the meal is the question. <laughs> I'll show you, I'll, I'll show you shortly, I'll mark it down. Um, so we just brined it, of course, as we would cure salmon with salt and with a bit of sugar and then we splashed the whiskey all over it, sliced it, and just some very simple roasted beets. And, and everyone got some horseradish cream, which, you know, certainly you could, we, we are, our intention was you might want to use it on your beef, but I would encourage you to try it, slather it on some of your soda bread with a slice of that salmon. So that's going to be your first course this evening. And I, I hope that you all enjoy it and you got your fancy plates out for this evening's first course. Great, lovely job and beautiful plating as well as always, not a surprise at all. And it's interesting speaking about seafood, especially from the island of Ireland. It's a, it's a thing that, you know, the first time I traveled abroad, people would ask me about our seafood and a fish was not something that I ate a lot of growing up. I mean, both of my parents were from the west of Ireland or are from the west of Ireland, sorry. And, uh, but I grew up in, in inner city Dublin and, uh, like many small countries, we exported a lot of our food because it was more valuable abroad uh, to the markets there than it was at home. And, and, you know, getting into this industry in my early 20s and understanding, you know, how valued our commodities were and, and the work that people put in that to many of us at home was, was unknown. You know, and the work and the evolution, like you said, that J.P. McMahon and other people at home have done to really put a spotlight on domestic uh, aquaculture and agriculture. And I mean... You know, as, as we say, like the potato will haunt us. The potato is this uh, vegetable that uh, will follow us no matter where we go. And it's, it is a cliche. And, and obviously, like every cliche, it's, there's some truth in it. Um, but our, our aquaculture, our, our salmon, our fish, our oysters are incredible. Our mussels. I got a call last week. I someone looking for langoustines here. I said they don't travel too well. Um, and just like, you know, the eastern coast of Canada, when you spend time out there and you, you see the similarities, not just in the culture and in the people, and obviously there's a massive amount of uh, Irish Canadians in that part of the world, but also the, the culture that they developed around their economy um, and the Prince Edward Island and Newfoundland and New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and these places where, where people came and they, uh, they developed an aquaculture and, a, and really lived off the land and the ocean. And that's something that I think we've only started to really realize in the last 15 or 20 years that we've got some of the best seafood in the world in Ireland. And we're so lucky to be able to get it uh, here in Canada. I know that, you know, when some, uh, from time to time I brought oysters over, sometimes I can get oysters quicker from Ireland 
They, I, I dealt with an oyster grower there and he would take the oysters out of the of, uh, Claire Galway. He would take them out of the ocean on a Sunday afternoon. They would go down to Shannon. They would get on the freight uh, flight from Shannon on Monday morning and they would be with me by Monday evening. And, uh, and some of our Canadian oysters obviously would be shipped up by truck. It may take two or three days to get here from the East Coast, but this global village that we live in now has made it so easy to to get products from around the world but like you said it's important that we make sure that we have a balance both of yes. ingredients from our own back door um, and really celebrate those and celebrate like ontario some of the most incredible ingredients that we can get in our own back door and that's something that i think we need to be very mindful of yeah and we uh, i i mean i think when we talk about food and and i always love it when i uh we have a lot of young irish that come and they work in our restaurant and, and we have an absolute blast with them but I love it when they say they want to get on the bus to go to Vancouver I think I'll just get on the bus and, and go and visit the west coast because they don't understand the size of the country you know it's it, Canada is such a huge geographical space uh, we don't have a lot of people living across the country so you know sometimes it does create those challenges but uh, what I love to see happening in Canada now is we've got all these wonderful regions that are embracing their their local agriculture. Um, Owen, you're going to uh, you're going to be uh, recognizing this. I'm calling hands on the pass uh, for my my server is going to pick up the two plates here. Okay. Kevin, Kevin is is going to serve, and I'm going to just pop in my nose into the oven because I did start to warm up the um, carrots and the potatoes for the next course, and uh, I'm just going to have a look at them. And um, yeah, we're, we're just clipping along. I hope everyone, if anyone has questions, you know, I'm happy to uh, help you out in any way that I can. But I'm, yeah. I'm just gonna take a look in the oven here. Yes, and on that note, if I, I know there's been some chatter in the chat here. If anyone has questions, feel free to post them. If you're having a culinary crisis, we're here to help. I don't think we can show up that quickly, but we'll certainly do our best virtually to provide some culinary support. Oh, beautiful. Look at those potatoes. That yes. Uh, I just thought the plan was such a an interesting way to you know get up, lift the potato up just to elevate it a little bit here. And <laughs> right, and just going back to the the starter course, have you any particular plating technique that you would recommend? I know we saw a little touch of your plating there. If you want to show it again, was there was there any uh, thing specifically with the juxtaposition of the beets and the the cured salmon? Were the beets cured as well? Uh, the, the, the salmon, no, the beef, with the beef we did on sous vide. Oh, the beets, I'm sorry. The beets. Yeah. Oh, hello. Um, the beets we roasted and then we just tossed them in a, in a little bit of a lemon vinaigrette. They're on some arugula frise, tore off a chunk of soda bread, of course. And, uh, yeah, again, very, very simple. And, you know, chefs, we like to pile our food up on the plates. <laughs> yes. We go through these trends where it's up, it's down, it's small, it's big. Right, right. <laughs> Keep big. it simple. Keep that's it. it. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, there's such beautiful color on the plate and that's something that, you know, and uh, in my position, I work at George Brown Chef School as, as Donna knows. And, uh, you know, we, we have the next generation of, of uh, both hotel management and hospitality students and culinary students as well. And I always talk to students about, it's not just how it tastes, especially in food service, it's also how it looks. That's and, you know, we, we eat with our eyes before we actually taste with our mouth. And, uh, you know, I, I see when you see, uh, you know, I always describe it as the Big Mac uh, psyche. You see the Big Mac on the billboard or in the commercial on TV, and it's this, you know, fluffed up, beautiful, tall burger. I've never seen a Big Mac in, in real life that looks like that. So, you know, it's very important. And the beautiful deep color of the beets, the, the beautiful rich orange of the salmon. And then, uh, like you said, the, the accoutrements that you have around it. And um, getting great feedback on your soda bread, Donna. Someone or who is this that says it's absolutely divine. I know. I wish we could have sent out Kerry Gold with it. Um, and maybe maybe the right honorable uh, James Maloney might be able to work with our uh, our friends in CFIA and, and so forth to get a little bit more Irish dairy in there. But I know it's a, a sticky wicket. Um, I, I myself tend to bring back some Kerrygold butter. We can get the cheese obviously here in Canada, but not the butter, unfortunately. And when well, I go down and see. I have to confess when I when I've gone to Ireland uh, numerous times, it's uh, 
smuggling <laughs> the yes. birds in the suitcase. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so immigration uh, or, uh, you know, they haven't caught up with me yet, but yeah. one of these days I'll get busted. So Owen, um, I just want to just jump to the beef because people may be yeah, please do. climbing. So the beef came in a bag because we did it en sous vide, you know, only the French would make cooking beef this complicated, but we're using a triple A uh, Canadian beef that comes from Wellington County and uh, we wanted to cook it medium rare. And so we did it in a sous vide, a warm water bath, very low temperature. So, you know, you're, you're welcome to eat it as is out of the package because it is cooked or you can warm it up in the oven. And, um, but there'll be some wonderful juice in the bag. And I encourage you to pour that into your little saucepan that you had going with your mushroom, the, the wild mushroom jus. So I've just popped that in there because it's all about, you know, building layers and layers of flavor. I'm gonna put it back on the stove. And now the beef is essentially, as I mentioned, uh, it is cooked through. So at this point, you could just sear it very quickly. I've got a cast iron pan over here that I'm gonna do it on. Or you could pop it in the oven with your vegetables if you wanted. And if you, if you like your beef well done, um, as some do, then by all means, just leave it in the oven for a bit longer. But uh, this is a great way when we're cooking, you know, we're cooking uh, for a large group of people and we want that consistency. And I think, Owen, that's probably something you're teaching now. They never taught that in culinary college when I was there, but there's a lot of great technology that we have that uh, you know, gives us greater results. For sure. Yeah. So we're gonna take a quick one question, just as people are maybe starting to pop their main course in the oven, we're gonna take a little bit of a 15 or 20 minute musical interlude. So one question from Constance, is the jus gluten-free? Is there a roux in it? Is there any flour? Is no. it? Okay. The is gluten-free. Uh, yeah, it's just basically an intense reduction. We made a beef stock, we reduced it down. Uh, we've got some, the mushroom in it. Uh, uh, there's a little splash of port, <laughs> you know. Yes, yeah. why not? <laughs> so yes, you're, you're good to go. Great, so we'll have, uh, we'll introduce our musicians now and Donna, thanks a million. We'll see you in about 15 or 20 minutes. Thank you, Owen, enjoy Perfect. your first course. Bon appetit, everyone. Uh, so we're delighted to welcome two wonderfully talented musicians in a very unique pan-Atlantic uh, evening of entertainment here. Uh, I hope I can see them. Uh, we can see uh, Aoife Nivreen and Tom Power. I'll give them introductions in a moment. We're going to see a short recording from them in a moment. So I'm sure William is going to, uh, to spool that up. But we've got a unique, obviously, this is a very unique celebration. It's, it's, it's as Donna said, we're pivoting back to the new world. Um, and here's a video from Tom Power and Ethan Evreen.
So that was a wonderful musical interlude by Tom Power and Aoife Nivreen. I think, I hope Tom and Aoife can hear me and I hope to see them momentarily. I see one, I see two. Welcome, great to see you both. Uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm sure you'll recognize these two people, but uh, Tom Power is uh, originally from St. John's, Newfoundland. He is involved with Dardanelles, his band, and you'll know his dulcet Newfoundlander tones from CBC's uh, music and arts show and culture show, Q. Um, great to see you, Tom. And he's also uh, outside of this pandemic and whenever we can get back into it, he's a regular fixture anchoring the session at Dora Kills, another, another great establishment here in Toronto owned by Jane Noonan, a fellow Newfoundlander. And uh, Dora Kills on the Danforth, he's there with Patrick Orso on Sundays. And uh, this lady here that's with us tonight, I've known for a little over 30 years because outside of uh, these two dimensions, we also happen to be first cousins. So there's about <laughs> four degrees of separation here. Um, Ethan Evreen is originally also a fellow dub. I uh, grew up on the north side, though. We really don't talk about that part because I'm a south sider. Um, and despite the fact that our mothers are sisters and, and her uh, mother and father were a huge influence on me as godparents as well, um, Aoife is now based in London, England, and uh, is an extremely talented musician. I think she's been playing violin for about 28 of those 30 years. Great to see you, Aoife, and great to see you, Tom. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks, Owen. Thank you, Owen. Well, it's nice uh, so to make your face. <laughs> it is, it is. And like, uh, like I was talking with Donna a few moments ago, I mean, these the travel meals and entertainment world, uh, anyone who has an uh, puts expenses for work will know what those three words mean and we've obviously seen a huge impact on our food on our drink but also on our culture as well um, and and I'm sure that both of you have seen incredible change in the industry over the last year and um, how's it been oh do you want to take this one Tom I can go second uh well I mean in some ways um you know, Eva's been affected in a really in interesting way as part of the uh, sort of Broadway-ish West End show that she's a part of there it's been challenging in all elements of the cultural sector without a shadow of a doubt. Not only have musicians had tours canceled, not only have films not been able to film, not only have, um, you know, virtually every single part of the, of the cultural museums haven't been able to open. It's been a tremendous challenge. But um, what's, been, what's been remarkable to me is the resilience of, of the artists. You know, we're fortunate to be here in Canada where we have, we were able to get uh, the CERB, the, the, you know, the, the relief package and artists were able to still make music, still able to, to write records. More music came out, more unbelievably creative ways still create during this time um, happened. And I also learned myself that I couldn't stay away from it. And on Sundays where we would normally go into doors and playing tunes, I would go over to Patrick Orso's front step in minus eight degree weather with a kerosene heater on bust, trying to have a couple of tunes and trying to have a couple of like a few drinks out of a thermos. So uh, uh, yeah, we're resilient nonetheless, but you know, I've been fortunate enough through my work at the CBC to be able to keep going and, and, and through the value of the CBC to be able to still go into work and, and, and try to tell the story of, of artists during this pandemic, especially in Canada. Resilience is the word that comes to mind. But Aoife, I'd love to hear what you've been going through. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's been a very strange year. I mean, as Tom says, like, well, I, I had to suddenly get used to this like digital medium of playing music, which I'd never really done before. I was never one to post videos. I was never one to really engage with any sort of digital platform. So um, I was working on a show called Come From Away, which um, as Tom knows, is based in Newfoundland. I, I had that seat on the, on the West End, but I, I do a lot of different things. Like, you know, I'm a classically trained violinist that was brought up by two traditional musicians. And my freelance career has been really, really varied. I can't even begin to describe how bizarre my life can be sometimes, which is why I do it. It's why I love it. And as a result of the pandemic, I found myself in a practice room looking at four walls for six to eight hours a day again, which I, I hadn't done since I was in college. So yeah, um, albums and digital concerts and sound and getting used to that whole new world that I'd kind of avoided for so long was um, a real learning, a real learning curve. And I guess you know, every musician will look back and hopefully have taken the time to do the things they don't usually get to do, you know, so I didn't have those 4am 
airport wake up calls, which was, you know, that was nice. Um, it was a sunny summer in London, so I could explore the place a bit. That was nice. Um, but it's been 12 months now since the West End and the theatres and the, the concert halls closed here. It's going to be exactly 12 months on the 16th of March. And I've got itchy feet, like I'm, I'm ready to go back. So as soon as things are open, I have a few things lined up that I'm pretty excited about. That's fantastic. Tom, I'm curious how easy it is to tune a guitar or a fiddle in minus eight when you're under a kerosene heater. <laughs> you, you, it, it, it starts to slip pretty quickly. It, 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 go, it goes from a lovely set of tunes to abstract art pretty quickly. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure the local, the local wildlife were wondering what was going on probably as the night went on. Um, it was, but I tell you though, what was lovely about it was there was such, as, as Eva says, you know, there was, there was such a, a great, pivot that happened to the Zoom concert, the digital concerts. But it was never as good, you know? And, and, and I think that taught us the power of live performance, that even when we were home and people were putting on concerts, it was never quite as good as seeing the real thing live, as much as I'm delighted to be here. But when we were in minus eight, we still had people coming out of their houses just to try and be near live music. And uh, I, I, like Aoife, I'm so excited about, about starting it again inside where it's warm. That's it. And we look forward to that hopefully very soon. So tell us a little bit about that, Eve, if you want to take the lead on this, tell us a little bit about that first track that you just played on the video. Well, that first track are three tunes I learned from my dad, who's an Illin Piper called Mick O'Brien. And they were called Bumper Squire Jones on Shandana, which means the old person in Irish. And the last one is O'Sullivan's March. So they're actually clan marches or as I described them to Tom, very strange jigs, very traditional tunes and just tunes that were passed down by my family from generation to generation. So, um, you know, I, I see that soda bread. I see that, uh, that Irish salmon. I feel very homesick here in the UK. And um, it's always nice to just play a few tunes from home and, you know, get that lovely warm fuzzy feeling. <laughs> That's right. And I remember Bumper Squire Jones, your dad recorded on his first album, May Morning Jew, which wasn't yesterday or the day before, as we say. 1996. 1996. <laughs> I remember like it was yesterday. Um, so, Tom, and you obviously a huge amount of influence in Newfoundland from from Irish and, and uh, Celtic music. Uh, any particular um can you remember like growing up like was there a particular influence on you or did you hear tunes that you know as you grew and you uh, you got older and you realized this global connection like that they it started to all make sense at first i always knew there was a connection between ireland and newfoundland i always knew that my grandmother who was from trapassi on the southern shore of newfoundland spoke with an extremely i was told an extremely irish accent i also knew that my name was tom power and that was extremely funny to a lot of irish people when I traveled for the first time when I was 15 years old to Ireland to play a gig alongside a, a, a couple of fiddle players, um, I was playing bass at the time, which was a horrible idea. I got on stage and I said, hi, my name is Tom Power and everybody laughed, we were in Waterford. And afterwards, I didn't know what I had said, but they pulled out the phone book. I was telling William this earlier today. They pulled out the phone book and showed me the rows of Tom Powers that were living there at the time. So obviously I started to understand, I, I, and then while I was there, my, um, my brother-in-law, who's a great um, Irish and, and um, sort of Django Reinhardt style guitarist named Dwayne Andrews from the East Coast of Canada, he asked if I would pick up an album by Andy Irvine and, and Paul Brady. And I, cause he was unable to get it in Canada at this point. So I picked up a couple of copies and I figured I'd get one for myself. I brought it back and I fell deeply in love with Irish music. I became sort of consumed by Irish music. And then one day Dwayne said to me, he said, I know you love this stuff, it's here too. We have our version of this. And since then I started, I did a degree in folklore and memorial where I was going around and trying to find connections between songs that I was getting from people in remote communities in Newfoundland and trying to find historical antecedents of them in, in Ireland. And it's been a really rewarding journey to see how in some ways the music progressed through Newfoundland, through time, through immigration, but also in some ways how the music stayed still. Due to our own isolation, we weren't getting the same number of, um, the, you know, the, the same number of influences that Ireland was, was getting. We weren't getting as many TV stations. We weren't getting as many radio stations. We weren't getting as many visitors. So there are tunes that are played in Newfoundland, which uh, Eve and I are going to talk about a little bit later, that are sort of preserved from hundreds and hundreds of years ago. They may have actually fallen out of favor in Ireland, but are still played in Newfoundland. And it, it's a pretty, it's a pretty remarkable realization, I have to say. Incredible. So uh, I think you're going to play another set for us. What have we got next? 
Ooh, who wants to go first? You go huh? first. You go first. Okay. Well, I might actually just start it from the very beginning. So there was an amazing Protestant minister called Canon James Goodman, who died in 1896. So his years of being active as a music collector in the Munster area of Ireland, in Skibbereen, Kent Cork, if anybody's familiar with that place, um, he collected the music of the local people and the music of the traveling musicians. He was a piper, a flautist, a singer, and a fluent Irish speaker, albeit being Protestant, which was, you know, a kind of a strange position to be in at that time. He ended up being a professor of Irish in Trinity College. And in the late 80s, early 90s, these manuscripts were found where he had donated them to Trinity College and they'd gotten lost for over 100 years. Um, I am very lucky to be on the board of the Irish Traditional Music Archives for the last five or six years. So I have an invested interest in the preservation of the music, but also, as Tom says, the evolution of the music. So there's a lot of people there who are probably familiar with the song, The Dawning of the Day, like. Translates to Fania Gallon Lay in Irish. So I was looking through the first collection of this book and I found Fania Gallon Lay and it sounded completely different. So I'm going to start with that tune. Then I'm going to go into a tune called The Cauliflower. So just to take away any of those potato images, we obviously had cauliflower. Love the, love the culinary the reference, Eva. I know, I'm telling you. And yeah. the final one is what we will hopefully be doing very soon after COVID. The final tune is called Kissing and Drinking. So if they were doing that in the 1850s, we'll be doing it again, that's for sure. So this is the Canon government version. So the version that we would have heard and that would have traveled to Canada and the US around the 1850s, 1860s. This is what we would have heard as dawning of the day. Take it away. <laughs>
absolutely fantastic as always, Aoife Boulabos. So, Tom, your retort to that challenge that was laid down. I'm very, uh, yeah, I don't have much, to, I don't much have to say to, to say back to that. Though I do find it interesting, you know, looking at the development of, of Irish music in Newfoundland. One thing that um, didn't come over very much is actually the fiddle. The, you know, the, the it was, um, fiddle didn't travel very well across the North Atlantic. So, you know, uh, a lot of our music is accordion based, you know, box based, and of course, song based. So in my band, the Dardanelles, our singer Matthew Byrne sings all these beautiful, you know, old songs from Newfoundland and, you know, we play guitars and, and fiddles and bazookis and all that stuff behind them. Um, but I thought just, you know, given the, the history of, of Irish songs in Newfoundland, I try to sing a couple of, uh, I'd like to sing a couple of Newfoundland songs tonight, if that's all right with you. So, Absolutely. So this is one I learned from my grandmother, uh, Rita Power, again, potentially the most Irish name that's not in Ireland, who had never been to Ireland in her entire life. And she would, this is a, a relatively well-known song, or at least it was in, in Newfoundland, it's sort of fallen out of favor since. Um, and every year on Boxing Day, we would get together in my house and, and my, my cousins and all my aunts and uncles, we would get together and sing songs all night. And this was always uh, one she sang. Um, it's, a, it's a great song of lost love and it's called The Star of Logie Bay. Lovely. Ye ladies and ye gentlemen, I pray you'll end near. While I locate the residence of a lovely charmer fair, the flowing of her yellow locks and stole my heart away. And her place of habitation was down in Logie Bay. Twas on a summer's morning that little place I found. I met her aged father who did me sore confound. Says if you address my daughter, I'll send her far away, and she never will return again while you're in Bogey Bay. Twas on the very next morning he went to St. John's Town, engaged for her a passage on a vessel outward bound. He robbed me of my heart's delight and sent her far away and left me here downhearted for the star of Logie Bay. How could you be so cruel as to part me from my love? Her tender heart beats in her breast as constant as a dove. And Venus was no fairer, nor the lonely month of May. May the heavens above shine down its love on the star of Logie Bay. So now I'll go a roving. It's here I cannot stay. I'll search the whole world over through every country. I'll search in vain through France and Spain, likewise America, till I do sight my heart's delight, the star of Logie Bay. Now to conclude and finish the truth to you I'll tell. Between Torbay and Outer Cove is where my heart doth dwell. She's the finest girl there graced our isle, so everyone did say. May the heavens above shine down its love on the star of Logie Bay. Fantastic, Tom. And I mean, such a great story. You know, the songs like that, just like tunes, like Eva said, are passed down through generations and generations. And, the, you know, I suppose the insular nature of Newfoundland as a region, you know, these, these songs were passed down and weren't as impacted, like you said earlier, by, by kind of 
different peoples and different cultures coming through, maybe like so, some other parts of Canada and the world. That's absolutely beautiful. I'd also add that when we joined Confederation in 1949, all of a sudden the first generation of people to be born Canadians and not Newfoundlanders really took great heart in preserving their culture and preserving the traditions of, of their families. And you saw a great, um, you know, a, a great acceptance and a great love and a great promotion of the, of the songs we have been taught over the years. So I'm endlessly grateful to them too. Beautiful. So I think we're going to go back and check in on Donna and I, I'm sure people are getting peckish and I'm going to see you two again in a few minutes, I believe for some polkas. So uh, I'll see you in about 10 minutes or so. We'll okay. be here. Take care. We'll <laughs> Chef Dewar, how are we doing? Good. I'm in, start my video. There we go. There she is. Beautiful. <laughs> the moment I go to, you know, clean my glasses is the moment you need. I know. I, while, Tom, <laughs> while Tom was singing and I was having a lump getting my throat, I was also trying yeah. to uh, pop back some of your wonderful soda bread and butter. And uh, I, I ran out of Kerrygold. I usually stock up when I go down to my in-laws in the U.S. And uh, we, I usually bring back about 30 or 40 pounds of butter in the trunk of the car and... Uh, I'll keep them in the freezer. And the last time we were down was Thanksgiving 12 months ago. So I used my last half pound of butter about three weeks ago. But I think James Maloney said in the chat that he's on it. So I think that constitutes a legally binding agreement to me. So hopefully by Canada Day, we'll see Kerry Gold here. It is like gold. It's well, it's well named for sure. In, indeed it is. Um, so let's talk about the main course because yeah. I think people are probably, if they haven't already started it, they're certainly ready to tuck in and uh, hopefully they're on schedule and a little bit of plating tips on what you, what you have for mains. Well, uh, before I jump into the mains, the music is wonderful. Um, it's so great to cook and listen to live performance. Well, live Zoom performances, but live enough. And um, yeah. Everything is ready. I, I just popped it all in the oven as I suggested we do. And again, I know timing is sometimes a little tricky, but you can see the potatoes there. I'm trying to get the good angles and the carrots and the, the, the tenderloins, which I just, again, seared. I seared them on the top of the stove, but as I mentioned in the notes, you could pop them in the oven. So now you're just gonna put it on the plate and serve it. It's that simple. Yeah. Um, so and you I'm said, go you ahead. Said you, the tenderloins were sous vide. You said you did them sous yeah. vide. I did them all on sous vide. Yeah. And uh, for those who are wondering what the heck is sous vide or en sous vide, as the French would say, it's it's not an Irish term. I'll tell you that. <laughs> it's not an Irish term. That's for sure. Um, but it is, a, it is a technique that we embrace a lot in the modern kitchen these days because again, it, especially if you're cooking on volume, it helps you with that time and temperature piece that we talked about earlier. I just want to show you the, the stack, the layers of the flan. Look at that. That is it's perfect. So, delicious. so I'm just going to, you know, put the potatoes, I'm going to give them center stage on my dish and throw a few carrots on the plate. And then the last thing to go down will be the beef jus, uh, which I've got simmering on the back pot here. And it's always nice to, you know, reduce it down. Oh, and you know, you know these little yeah. clips, you know? And if it, gets too, if it gets too thick, you can always splash a bit of water on it. And we're just gonna put it over the beef and I'm going to show you in a moment. I wanted to mention to Tom that um, when I was the chair of Restaurants Canada, uh, the chair gets to choose the location for the board of directors meeting. And I chose St. John's <laughs> Newfoundland and we took the directors from across the country. There we go. Beautiful. Beautiful. Tip in a little bit there. You can there see. There you go. Absolutely there wonderful. There you go. Again, very simple. Pretty hardy, like Kevin's got to, got to put this one away. Um, and there you go, the dinner is served. I'm calling hands again, or pick yeah. up, as we like to say, in the, restaurant, in the restaurant business. And like you said, simplicity. I mean, that's where the, the food that we eat, and like you mentioned earlier, our, our emotional connection with food is usually something that was cooked for us, our earliest memories uh, of what we ate at home. And uh, typically it was a mother or a grandmother, you know, just because that's the way life was. 
um, and our emotional connection with food. It was simplicity on a plate and even the nostalgia that it gives us and that feeling. I mean, uh, people ask me often when I'm on a panel, what's the best meal you've ever had? And I'll speak, you know, I've been lucky enough to eat in some wonderful places around the world, but I'll tell you this. Sometimes it's when I go back to Dublin and it's just a toast and cheese sandwich in my parents' kitchen because that feeling of home, uh, as we say, Nilain Tinton Mar the Hinton fame. There's no place like home. There's no fireplace like your own fireplace. And that's what food, just like the music, like Tom and Aoife said, mm-hmm. it transports us back to a time uh, and when we were a child or, or you know, a young adult, and it really brings back those feelings of nostalgia. So I know uh, I know people are really excited about this main course. It's it looks absolutely delicious. Well, um, you know, my grandmother used to say. Uh, uh, you know, if, they, if you were bringing someone home, home for dinner unexpectedly, you know, which, which uh, we would do sometimes, and sometimes late, you know, after you might have been out, out and about. And uh, she had a saying, just, just put out the Irish linen <laughs> and you could scramble some eggs and make a piece of toast, Donna. Okay and just show genuine hospitality. And, uh, you know, we've talked about this before, you and I, Owen, and uh, I do think that the, the hospitality of the Irish, just like the hospitality of, of the folks of Newfoundland and Labrador, I mean, it's so genuine and so heartfelt. You don't hear people say, wow, I went to Ireland, the sun was shining and it was, the weather was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think it's the same for Newfoundland and Labrador. Yeah. Um, but you do hear people come back and say, my gosh, I just, I fell in love with the people. And uh, I know the time we went to St. John's and we took this bunch of directors, you know, these are all the VIPs from Tim Hortons and, and uh, you know, McDonald's and, and all the big restaurant chains. And, and of course the independents as well. And we took a boat tour to go whale watching out of Bay Bulls. And the whole idea was to go back into St. John's Harbor. And we hit some choppy weather. Um, I thought we were on the set of the deadliest catch, but in fact, we were on, we were on a cruise. And, um, but we had so much fun and we laughed and we laughed and we told stories about it forever. So just great, but that hospitality is so important. It, and it doesn't, it isn't really, the food or the the restaurant or how many courses you eat it's just about someone being incredibly genuine towards you and i think that is what we're all missing so much right now during this pandemic and i think you've absolutely nailed it i mean that's been the challenge is, is you can have a three michelin star meal at home you if you you could fly in a chef but I, you know i i spoke to someone a couple of months ago and i said i'm really starting to miss just walking into a a pub on my own and being surrounded by strangers, not necessarily to talk to anyone, but just that sense of of community that, you know, we can't replicate with these. I mean, look, this is, it's fantastic to have the technology to be able to do events like this, especially when we've got people both in in Europe and, and Canada live at the same time, but it doesn't replace that nostalgia or that hospitality, like you said, which is really a feeling of being in place and the feeling that we, you know, we're social creatures as humans and we don't have the ability to, to relate to each other uh, in two dimensions like we do in three dimensions. And it's the food, it's even the smell, the aroma, the sound of music, the, the timbre of it feels different. You know, if you're standing in Dora Kyo's on a Sunday afternoon or on a Thursday night and you can feel the music pulsing through the floorboards, that's something that you can't replicate with even the best sound system in the world. So it's, it's exactly the same with food food and it's you know having grown up uh, as a musician uh, from a very young age just like Eva and Tom I mean I think when I went into food as a as a profession as much as a passion I discovered how close uh, art and and food are intertwined food and drink and how they're very similar they are you know and how how they give you this feeling these goosebumps that we talk about um and it's the same, like the aroma of something. You could walk by a restaurant and you could smell something you haven't smelled in 20 years. And it might instantly transport you back to a moment in time right. or a feeling or an experience that you had with a, a loved one. Um, and, and you can't really replicate those things in two dimensions. Well, today when uh, all the wonderful volunteers came from uh, everyone who's around this table tonight, uh, came to 
deliver meals. And at one point it was like a part, felt like a party in the restaurant uh, because we, uh, we hadn't had that many people at one time in the main dining room. And as you know, Owen, we have a very big room and it's of course stripped of furniture. But um, one of my uh, staff came up to me and said, it feels like a, it's very strange to see so many people in the restaurant and it wasn't so many it was maybe maybe we were 10 10 or 12 but it just and everyone was talking and excited to see other people and i just it struck me at you know a restaurants in toronto have been closed for in for sit down dining since october the 10th that's a long time and um, we really do miss each other it's it's you don't know until you get it back that's it that's it absence makes the heart grow fonder right that's right. Yeah. Well, listen, I'm going to let everyone enjoy their, their Absolutely. course. And I just wanted to, I forgot to mention there's onion marmalade, red onion marmalade uh, that we made uh, from scratch. We make it at the restaurant and it's just kind of like a, a jewel on the plate, but it's really lovely to go with your beef and your potatoes. So everyone, please enjoy the main course. <laughs> Great. I'm going to see you in time for dessert in about 20 minutes, Sana. Bon appétit. Thank you. Bon appétit. So now I'll, I'll have our illustrious musicians come back, Tom and Aoife, or maybe they're off. I don't think Aoife has the, uh, has the soda bread, but Tom may have. So I think we're gonna spool up another video and uh, we'll hand it over to Tom and Aoife. An absolute wonderful set of polkas there. <laughs> I mean, you've changed so much in the 30 seconds. So tell me a little bit, Aoife, about those polkas. So this is the this is maybe the coolest story this is actually of the this story. collaboration okay. that we've done. You're setting the bar high, Tom. You're, okay. you're setting the bar high, but go on. <laughs> okay, go. So I was in London thinking, 
what should we record? And I was like, we definitely have to play polkas because when Tom and I met each other first playing together in Montreal, I think we played quite a few polkas and I learned some Newfoundland tunes from the Dardanelles. And, you know, again, going back to what was being collected around the 1800s, these are the only two polkas that appear in the tunes of the Munster Pipers, the second volume of books by Canon James, Good James Goodman, which is obscene because in Schlieve Lucre in the Munster area of Ireland, they only play polkas and slides. That's all they do. All they do. And the, the first polka wasn't even called a polka in the book. It was called a reel. So I, I play with a trio when I do these good and we were sitting in the room going like, there's no way, there's no way this is a reel. This is most certainly a polka. So we turned it into polka rhythm and it suddenly made sense. And then we found the only other polka in the book and put them together and the set was gorgeous. So I was like, I have to play these for Tom. He's gonna love them. He'll, you know, he'll be a big fan. So I sent them to Tom and... So she sends them to me and I write back and I go, oh, that's a Newfoundland tune. That second tune is a tune that's, that comes from Newfoundland. And, and she said, well, it's impossible, like, it's not impossible, but it's, it's, like, it's a tune like no one's ever heard before. It's not a very well-known piece of music. And I found uh, a version of Nelly Musso, who was a great chin singer from the west coast of Newfoundland around the French Irish part of Newfoundland. And she uh, has a, she calls it, I have a bonnet filled with blue, a trim with blue, sorry, I have a bonnet trim with blue. And she does chin music, you know, but I'm that eaten, that eaten, that lum, dum, eaten, that lum, that eaten, that lum, that eaten, that eaten, that lum. And I sent that recording of Nelly back to Eva, and she couldn't believe that we had found this sort of undiscovered Irish tune in Newfoundland. Yeah, the only polka in the book, of course, was a Newfoundland tune. I was so excited. I was like straight in the phone to my dad and the flawless in the tree. I was like, guys, you'll never guess what? This is amazing. <laughs> it's like, we're not the first people to play this tune in 200 years. They play it in Newfoundland all the time. It's, it's wild. And I should say, yeah, polkas and slides, um, a lot of the uh, immigration from, um, uh, you know, came from Sleep Luca region and 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 even when the when the Irish music scene kind of restarted again in the 1980s when sessions began in Newfoundland that was when uh, the great Seamus Cray the great fiddle player Seamus Cray moved to Newfoundland um, alongside Patty Keenan who I believe moved there, there as well and and noticed that we were playing all these what we call singles and doubles but were actually polkas and slides um, and that became a big part of our heritage. That's incredible. And I remember vividly, uh, probably in my early teens, and Aoife will remember many years spent down in Milltown Malbay and out in Quilty and in West Clare during the summer, um, meeting a couple of girls from, they were twins actually, and they were from Cape Breton um, and in, in Nova Scotia. And they were two of the most phenomenal Cape Breton fiddlers I've ever met, but being blown away by something that we grew up with for so long and took for granted and assumed that this was a very insular thing. And it was only when you realized the impact and the way this music, both from Scotland and Ireland, traveled around the world over the last couple of hundred years. And, and I, sometimes I think we almost take ourselves for granted. Um, you know, I remember when I played in the U.S. and, and how Irish, our Irish Americans and Irish Canadians as well almost cling on to this culture uh, even more so than I feel we do. I feel like sometimes, especially myself, I let it down where I don't maybe cling on to it because it's something that you're immersed in from such a young age and you assume that it's just normal to people. Um, and then you realize abroad that it really, it was people that, you know, carried the flame and continued uh, to hold the torch through generations when it was easy to say, let it slide. And, and really, like you said, in Newfoundland, held on to it. And I mean, there's obviously massive stories of emigration and that insular thing. You know, there's a famous documentary that aired on TG Cahar, which is our national Irish language station. And it was about a, a town in Wexford that had a lot of emigrants in the 1800s, Newfoundland. And they were interviewing the Newfoundlanders and it sounded like they were from Wexford. I couldn't believe the actual linguistic uh, accents were exactly the same as people from Wexford and Waterford and hadn't been impacted by you know any really outside influences and even nowadays still have an accent that's that's very similar to the southeast part of Ireland it's an incredible incredible connection between the the two islands. Am I wrong in saying that the tricolor flag for Ireland was actually invented by a man who came back from Newfoundland with his family and was based in Wexford? Now I may be wrong if anybody out there can correct me I do remember reading about that in the archives I forget his name, but his family had gone over to Newfoundland to work. He was born there and he came back 
lived in Wexford. I believe he was the mayor of Wexford and the tribe. Oh, Waterford. Thank you very much. Kathy Waterford. Murphy. Kathy says um, Waterford. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So it's, it's an amazing connection that I think is sometimes overlooked. Thomas Francis Marr. There we go. Kathy Murphy is on the ball. Thank you so much, Kathy. Yeah. So I know you, I know you have another couple of pieces for us. Well, I, I'm hoping Eva, so Eva and I, uh, we met for the first time about five or six or eight or nine, wow. maybe 10 years ago, <laughs> a long time at, ago. A, at, a, at a festival in um, in Montreal when she was there with her father, Mick, and I was there with my band, the Dardanelles. And there's a whole story about how we became accidental roommates and didn't know for three days. That being said, um, Eva and I reconnected this year when I dropped her a line after she was in a fantastic documentary about the legendary fiddler Tommy Potts. And um, I'm, I'm excited that Eva is gonna play some of that music, not to put her on the spot, but uh, <laughs> he, that, that documentary sort of blew my mind. And then I was watching it and all of a sudden there's my old buddy in it who I hadn't, I, I hadn't talked to in a few years. So it was, it was lovely. Um, well, what, what would you like me to play from that specifically? I what mean, would you go for? Well, I mean, whatever you want for. Okay, well, I'll go, I'll go hardcore. So I grew up in Dublin and my grandfather, both of my grandfathers were from Dublin. As Owen says, I grew up on the north side of Dublin, um, but the less said about that, the better. And Tommy Potts was a fiddle player who used to kind of take off in these incredible improvisations, like almost like a jazz soloist. So much so that he could not play in a session with other musicians. He was a complete genius. And I found this really intriguing growing up with the classical music and the Irish music going hand in hand that not many people did that. And um, when it came to going to university, I moved to Leipzig in Germany, so the very, very Eastern part of Germany, where all of a sudden I was kind of being uprooted from my own tradition, from being, you know, somebody that grew up in Dublin with a dad from Dublin, a granddad from Dublin, music from Dublin, even though Owen and I have mothers that were brought up in Sligo, which is a whole other tradition. And all of a sudden I'm landed in this German tradition of Bach everywhere. Mendelssohn started my school, oldest university in Germany. And I kind of put a foot in both worlds and thought like, surely I can do something here. So I've combined Bach with Tommy Potts just to show a little bit of what the two are. So just to give a small example, the tune I will play is um, called My Love is in America. And the normal version would sound something like this. <laughs> Tommy Potts version goes a little bit like this. Sarabond from Bach's second partita in D minor for solo violin and I've written my own Tommy Potts cadenza to go between the two parts so I hope you enjoy it.
Yeah, I hated. I hated to put you on the spot, but I, all <laughs> all month since we planned on doing that, I was just looking forward to you playing that. This whole gig has just been a, a ruse to hear you play that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you, it's the first time I've played it sitting down, like I'm in a session. Usually, <laughs> standing up. That was interesting. It's good to know I can, I've, you know, bring it out of Doris whenever I get over to Toronto, sitting down <laughs> in the middle of the session, see what they make of that. <laughs> <laughs> that might be uh, that that you'd hear a pin drop during that. That's incredible stuff. I think especially they call at it half fusion. past one in the morning, which it is yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, and our our clocks go forward tonight. So a PSA for everyone on the call that's based in uh, North America is that we lose our hour hour tonight rather than in uh, the UK and Ireland when it's a couple a couple of weeks away. It reminds me of uh, back in the sixties, apparently. There's a famous castle, I think Glenvey Castle in Donegal, and uh, you do a tour of it and they have placards at each room of famous people that stayed there. And uh, in one of the rooms, there's a, there's a placard that says world famous violinist Huey McMenamin stayed here once. Um, but it was actually Yehudi Menuhin, the, the famous violinist who spent some time there with the locals, referred to him as Huey McMenamin when he sat in on the sessions in Donegal. That's absolutely incredible. Tom, you have the uh, the enviable uh, task uh, of following that. I, guess. I really, so I really should. Go. I really should have gone first. You know. I think his his he's. I think his internet's about to probably go. He's probably uh, <laughs> oh, sorry about that, guys. I hold on. There's something going on here now. Yeah, I don't. I don't doubt that you can match that. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, now, I'm I'll... looking forward to some like you know Bach or Gregorian chant into a Newfoundland ditty. Come on, Tom, step I, I, up. <laughs> I, I'm going to do. I'm going to do a nice aria into a, into an old Newfoundland jig. You know, I was thinking, um, it, given the history of what we've been talking about, the relationship between um, Newfoundland and Ireland, this is a really um, somewhat well-known Newfoundland song. It doesn't get sung a whole lot again anymore, but it's one of my my favorites. It comes from the um, comes from the writing. It was actually um, written uh, in and around the early 1920s by a fellow named Mark Walker, who was from T uh, Tickle Cove in Bonavista Bay South in Newfoundland, just around the, the East Coast, kind of the, I'm from here and he there from here. And his father was uh, Marcus Walker from County Tipperary. So uh, there's, a, there's a pretty distinct um, Irish Newfoundland uh, connection here. And this is a song he wrote uh, based on a true story that happened, um, going to get your wood across the water, going to go, go, go get your wood across the pond. And of course, you know, the pond would freeze and you'd be able to take the horse and, and try to get over there a little bit faster than you normally would having to go around the pond. And you try to push it as long as you possibly could, possibly could to take that shortcut until you couldn't anymore. And this is, um, a, uh, this is a song, it's a story about that. Uh, the spoiler alert, uh, just in case you're wondering if I'm singing a song of tremendous cruelty, uh, the animal does live. I'll, I'll give you that at the end of the story. So the animal does live, which is a, always a horrible disclaimer to have to give for a song you're about to sing. But this is a song from um, Marcus Walker. Um, I haven't seen sung this one too much, so I'm, I'm pretty excited to try it anyway. Um, it's called Tickle Cove Pond. Mm. In cotton and hollin and frostin and snow, we're up against troubles that few people know. And it's only by courage and patience and grit and eating plain food will we keep ourselves fit. <laughs> <laughs> 
The hard and the easy we take as they come, and when ponds freeze over, we shorten our run. To hurry, my Holland, with spring coming on, I near lost me a mare out on Tickle Cove Pond. I knew that the ice, it grew weaker each day, but I still kept my mare and kept hauling away. One evening in April, bound home with a load, my mare sent some halting against the ice road. She knew more than I did as matters turned out, but lucky for me had I joined her in doubt. She turned all around me with tears in her eyes, as if she was saying, you're risking our lives. All of this I ignored with a whip handle blow, for men is too stupid, dumb creature to know. Ah, uh, oh, oh my lord, too many so stupid, dumb creature to know. Ah, the very next moment the pond gave a sigh, and up to our necks went poor Kitty and I. And if I had taken wise Kitty's advice, I ne'er would have taken that shortcut on the ice. Poor creature, she's dead. Poor creature, she's gone, and I'll ne'er get my mare out of Tickle Cove Pond. I raised an alarm you could hear for a mile, and the neighbor showed up in a very short while. You can always depend on the old birds and whites to render assistance in all your bad plights. To help a kind neighbor is part of their lives. The same can be said for their children and wives. When the bowline was fastened against the mare's chest, William White Forest shanty song made a request. There was no time for thinking, no time for delay. Straight from my heart went this song right away. Lay ho, William Walter, lay ho, William White, lay ho of the cordage and pull all your might. Lay ho of the bowline and pull all you can and give us a lift with poor kid on the pond. Lay ho, William Walter, lay ho, William White, lay ho of the cordage and pull all your might. Lay ho of the bowline and pull all you can and give us a lift with poor kid on the pond. Lay ho, William Mulford, lay ho, William White, lay ho, of the bowline and pull all your might. Lay ho, of the cordage and pull all you can. And with that, we pulled kid out of Tickle Cove Pond. There you go, Mark Walker. Uh Fantastic, Tom. Um, and like Ireland, I mean, there's a huge oral tradition of, of telling, you know, not just important historical uh, moments, but, you know, traditions and folklore and, uh, and family stories through the medium of song as much as music, isn't there? There is. Um, in fact, you know, like in Ireland, um, a lot of the ways that stories were told and news was told from one, from one place to another was often through songs. You know, there are there are songs about sh uh, near miss shipwrecks in Newfoundland, which seems always very strange to me. Songs about things that didn't really go that bad. I've learned a number of songs that sound so evocative. And afterwards, when I parse the lyrics, I go, nothing really happened. You know, like, I mean, like, <laughs> I, th I think the song is just about how they went out in the water one day and came back. And they said, well, that's how they had to tell people that everything had gone all right. right. So you have all these sort of songs that, that, that are, are, have lasted that way. And um, that song has become, Tickle Cove Pond has sort of become like a, is it Schrodinger's cat? Like, you know, is the, is the cat alive or dead yes. in the box? And there's always a great debate over whether the horse is dead or alive at the end of that. But I, I, my feeling is the earliest line, one of the line of the first verse is, I ne'er lost me a mare out on Tickle Cove Pond. I almost, lost me a mare on Antiquo Cove Pond. So right. in my opinion, the horse, is, the horse is around. The language is important. There's a, there's a lawyer in there somewhere making sure that that's accurate for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. Before Peter gets called. That's it. That's it. <laughs> and I know, Aoife, you mentioned a little bit about your, your mom and dad and, uh, and your granddad uh, back at home. And, and your, like, what are your earliest musical memories? Like, I, I know, I think my earliest memory, um, I was four, and I was actually going out to Marino School. You'll know this well, and I don't know if anyone on the call will know, to learn Tin Whistle with Dennis. 
Um, and I don't remember much else probably until my, my, you know, later single digit years, but I remember that very vividly. Um, and obviously your, your folks and my parents being such a big influence on our music growing up and um, was such a big part of our lives and, and still is obviously like what, what memories for you um, do you have from that, that time? It's so hard to say because there was not a day where I wasn't immersed in music, whether I wanted to or not. And actually, the reason I play the violin is because of William Pete's sister, Joanne. So William, another strange connection, William and I are neighbours and William, the Peets were my adopted family and Joanne played the violin. And at the age of one and a half, you know, I completely idolised the Peets, William and Laura and Joanne. They're just they were amazing and they looked after me. They played with me. They were just the most incredible family to have. And Joanne started playing the fiddle. So I had a huge tantrum at the age of one, of one and a half, I think. I don't think I could say much, but I could say that I really wanted to play the fiddle. And my parents said, absolutely no way. That's a terrible idea. That's never happening. <laughs> you know, you can have a tin whistle. So I got a tin whistle, really wasn't too pleased with that. Um, so my earliest memory is probably actually being put on the table in our front room while my mom was teaching polka one, polka number one, which we call F-A-B-A, -A. because those are the notes. Yeah. And I'm sitting on the table, surrounded by everybody that lived on our cul-de-sac, and William Pete was probably there with the tin whistle, and blowing into my tin whistle in protest, because I didn't want to be there with the tin whistle, I wanted a violin. And I couldn't have been more than 18, 20 months. So that's my first, I wouldn't call it a musical memory, <laughs> but that was definitely my first stand to be a musician. And then I got a violin for my second birthday and started Sorry. playing a few months later. And then, you know, just growing up with the cousin zone, mm. just playing every Friday. Owns mom is my godmother as well. She was my dancing teacher. Um, tell us more about William Pete. That just came in on the chat. Absolutely not. <laughs> I think you have to pay extra for that. That will be next year. That's in definitely person. extra. Yeah. That's definitely yeah. extra. All I'll say is the Pete's were the best neighbors ever. And I was very lucky to grow up with them. So every child that grew up on my cul-de-sac was, was taught music by my parents. Right. Um, so they That's all me. passed through our house. And my uncle Dennis, who Owen mentioned, actually passed away before I had a chance to meet him. He passed away in 1990 and he was in a wheelchair and was probably the finest whistle player Ireland or and well ever actually and you know it's I'm obviously a bit biased but it's it's true he recorded a solo album when he was 19 he won person of the year award he had an incredible life he worked I think he was head of HR for the department of finance for the, the government he was an incredible mind incredible musician and um yeah just another kind of member of the family that I grew up being very proud of and in a way I got to know him from learning his music retrospectively through his album and from hearing stories of family members of mine who you know obviously knew him very well. What was what was his name Ethan? Uh, Dennis O'Brien or Dunaka O'Brien yeah. um, and that you know it was it's it's an amazing thing to have that emotional connection and the biggest emotional connection for me to home is cooking and music. My mom is a great baker. We would have brown bread every brown day. Brown bread, yeah. Brown bread and jam in our house was the, the standard. And then, then my dad's mother, Granny O'Brien, Dennis's mother, um, white soda bread, the best ever. Um, it's never been beaten, though I haven't tried Donna's. Um, so I look forward to being able to do that in the future. Um, and it really is the smell, the smells of home, the smells of the kitchens. And the music that would be happening in the background, which was just nonstop. And that's that's what growing up was. So my earliest musical memory is it's all a musical memory. There's no there's no kind of difference. Everything was music related, whether we liked it or not. That's right. And the tin whistle, <laughs> I mean, is the I describe it as the training wheels of Irish music. But the people like Dennis and uh, 
you know, other virtuosos on that instrument because it, it, you know, it has a reputation of being a beginner's instrument, but certainly the people that played it and mastered it, it is a unique instrument and something that our penny whistle might be known as over here. It's a unique instrument. And when it's in the hands of a, ma a maestro, it really is, it sings like a lark. Um, and Tom, did you grow up in a musical family or, you know, obviously the, the culture of Newfoundland is very musical. You know, who, who influenced you in your, in your early career? My, I grew up with a musical family where music was certainly something we just sort of did. Um, there was no um, professional musicians in my, in my family and I had never really come across that many, you know. But when I was growing up, my father was a great guitar player, you know, and he could play, you know, to, to support the family singing that would happen an awful lot. And my mother is, is a, a tremendous singer, like a, just a wonderful voice. And when my mother was born in, in 19, she'll kill me if she's watching this, but you know, my mother was born in 1949, but her mother was 40 when she had her. So my grandmother was born in 1909. So a lot of the songs that we grew up singing were songs that she had learned from her mother, which meant that she was learning songs from essentially the 1910s, 1920s, and 1930s. So we would often sing all these songs together, like I mentioned on Boxing Day, but also kind of whenever we all got together. And in fact, when I started to learn the guitar, my father sat me down to, to teach me how to play the guitar. I asked him to be a, if I could learn one day when I was about 13. And I've, I've tried to explain this to people who, are, who don't come from a, a, a vernacular singing tradition or don't come from a communal singing tradition, um, and they don't necessarily understand how rare, how, how interesting this is, is that he didn't teach me, you know, here's how you play these scales or here's how you do all this. He said, I'm going to teach you how to play behind anyone's song, anybody who's singing, and you are going to be able to support them and you're going to be able to play along with them. And I learned how to play music in order to facilitate big communal sing-alongs. So I would learn a song in a key and then he would teach me how to play it in about three or four other keys. So I would learn transposition. So I would learn a little bit about how to play anything. He taught me ear training. He taught me all of those things. So that led me to um, having a half decent ear when it comes to like how to figure out, you know, chords and all that kind of stuff, which led me to being, you know, a guitar backer in this music, you know, because um, I, I still see it the same kind of way is that the, the tunes are just people singing songs together and it's my job just to be there and help out and, and support. Um, so I'm, I had a very uh, interesting um, musical you know, background. And then of course my sister started seeing Dwayne who was again, one of the finest guitarists on the East Coast. And he sort of instilled in me a little bit more discipline and trying. And then I picked up the bluegrass banjo and played bluegrass for 10 years. So you know, there's, that, there's that as well. But um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very, I consider myself to be very, very lucky to have come from a, a singing tradition that was all about getting together. And I think it's led me to really love the Irish session and scene as much as I do. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I, we all remember times as children when, you know, you're being forced to practice and it becomes a chore. But I think, you know, when you, you realize when you've got the, uh, the benefit of hindsight that music is a large part of the reason that we're all where we are today and it's you know it's been such a successful uh, skill I would call it uh, for all of us and uh, you know it's enabled it's like it's, there's no language in music it will travel anywhere in the world and it doesn't matter where you are in the world you know you'll find a common bond between you and another human being if you can both knock a tune out of something or or tell a story through a song if I'm going to throw down the gauntlet to you and, and Tom I'm going to follow as well but one more before we go back to Donna for dessert but I want you to play something that reminds you of Verbena Grove so that there's a street that Aoife is referring to it was Verbena Grove. I don't have to play anything um, that reminds me of Verbena Grove, do I? <laughs> no, I, I, I'm actually, I, I'm just waiting on my producer to give me the street that you grew up in in, in St. John's Town. <laughs> but Aoife, if you can give me some this, so the street that Aoife is referring to was in Bayside in Sutton on the north side. And I will admit, I spent the first couple of years of my life on the north side. And then uh, depending on which way you look at it, we, we either escaped or we were sent to the south side. Um, but that was a, a street that Aoife grew up on and a house that I spent many, many years in. I'm the eldest of four in four years, nothing like an Irish family there. And I, being the eldest, I was shipped off to my Auntie Fidelma, my Uncle Mick, for many days a week, uh, usually a whole weekend or whatever else. And I spent a lot of time in that house and it, it greatly influenced me. And I remember it like it was yesterday. So I want you to play a tune for the guests tonight that reminds you of those times on Verbena Grove. 
no pressure. Um, and I think it's called boot camp when you're sent to anti Fidelis well, camp. I don't think there's true. anything, that's like true. there's no holiday involved. <laughs> Um, wow. Definitely, it was music practice to be done and hang out with the peeps and the other kids on the road. Funnily enough, one of my earliest memories of being in Verbena Grove is a lot to do with Uncle Dennis because he had only passed away in 1990 and we had his, his LP record and I had a habit of playing LPs. Um, you know, those big old things before CDs and before iPods oh, and that's what before, you know, Bluetooth stuff. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Um, so I'm talking like early 90s. So we're going way back here. Right. And um, we had um, uh, his LP and I saw pictures of him. So I understood who he was and everyone around me played tune whistle. So I just presumed that he did that because that's what everybody did. In my mind, the world was full of musicians and everyone started on the tin whistle. Um, so I'm going to play a slower called Ni Er Knoch Nair Ishluk into a reel called Finbard Wires that I actually learned note for note from my uncle's LP as I grew up. And it was, it's, it's something that's very close to me because he was the eldest of five boys and him and my dad were best friends. Dad is also a fantastic whistle player and piper. So I think it was just so, it meant a lot to his brothers, my dad and my granddad, and my granny, especially when they heard the next generation of musicians, not only getting to know him, but kind of honoring him and everything he had achieved in such a short life. Um, it made it very special. Um, so it's called Mir Knochnar Ishluk, which means not on a mountain or in a lowland. So somewhere in the middle and that's kind of how I like to think of him and I I do like to think that he's listening and um if you really didn't like it it would be raining or really stormy in Salisbury at the moment so um near knuck nor ishak into Fimber Dwyer's
Absolutely beautiful, Aoife. That's fantastic and brings back great memories, I'm sure, of listening to that L LP, I think you referred to it as. I... Yeah, it's the, the big roundy thing. The big was, roundy it thing was, was it before it Was it before or after the MP3? I, I... I mean, maybe a few months before, a year okay. or so. Yeah. It had even had two sides. You could flip it. Oh, almost yeah. like a, ta a cassette tape, I believe. Not as fancy, but close enough, close you, enough. You and just, you couldn't wind it back with the pen. You couldn't pen wind either. it back with the pen. The pen, <laughs> that's right, that's right. And Tom, I'm, I, I don't want to say reliably informed, but because of the source here, but Black Marsh Road, St. John's is... Uh, <laughs> uh, pretty, pretty close. Uh, like, not too bad. They said near, so I, they put a disclaimer in there. I, I won't reveal my source, but uh, like you said, you had a, a wonderful... Uh, musical upbringing from both your mother and your father is there a particular song or tune or something that evokes those memories from from a time that wasn't yesterday or the day before oh yeah yeah there is it's not what i was going to do but I'll, I'll do that let me think about that now i think i know that song well enough i mean i got caught up on the last one but we seem to we seem to recover well so i get caught up on this one it's all good too that's it um, my God, I haven't sang this in, in years. Yeah, I could probably do a song that we used to, my, my, my family used to sing together. Um, look at the first few words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah okay, I'll do that. This is, a, this is a song my grandmother, uh, Rita Power, used to sing. It's a relatively kind of known song in, in Newfoundland. Um, and it's a song about uh, getting older, but I do want to know to say to anybody who might identify with this song, it's not, I'm not saying you're getting that much older. That's what that's all I'll say about it. Uh, this is a song we used to sing every every Christmas and every every time we'd all get together. Um, it's called "Now I'm 64." Lovely. Again, not that old. I pondered on those days gone by as we sat beside the mill and gazed upon the setting sun as it sank beneath the hill. I gazed on it once more, me boys, twas just and fresh and green. Twas just the same now as it was when we were sweet sixteen. Oh, how I long for those bright days to come again once more. But come again, they never will, for now I'm sixty-four. The little fish swims in the brooks and it wanders down below and swims as still and ever well as it did long, long ago. The little meadow by the brook is just and fresh and green, is just the same now as it was when we were sweet sixteen. Oh, how I long for those bright days to come again once more. But come again, they never will, for now I'm 64. Oh, the past is past, and she is gone, on earth we'll meet no more. But we will meet in heaven above on that eternal shore. And when we meet, we'll part no more. We both shall reign supreme. No more to think of days gone by when we were sweet sixteen. Oh, how I long for those bright days to come again once more. But come again, they never will, for now I'm 64.
There you go. Fantastic. And you you bounced back quickly there for me, putting you on the spot. So kudos <laughs> for that. Fantastic. I'm, I'm still dying to know how you got uh, uh, Black Marsh Road because I grew up on Canada Drive, which is off of Black Marsh Road. Yeah, pretty, pretty. There you go. Yeah. Close, close, but not not the exact. I'm idea. hiring you to do private investigator work for me in no. the future. You know. <laughs> That's it. Well, I'll give you both a break because that ran on a little long. But I know the feedback in the chat is that people are really enjoying the phenomenal uh, artistry. I should just call it and. Uh, I'm sure they're looking for a bit of a sweet tooth. So we'll pop back in a few minutes. I'm going to check in with Donna. I think it's time for dessert. And then we'll pop back for, I believe, some jigs and a bit of a, a bit of a yarn and a chat maybe before we wrap it up. Okay, we'll talk to you in a few minutes. Great, we'll see you then. Cheers, Bye. thanks a minute. So Chef Donna, how are we doing? We're good, we're oh, good. There's, uh, <laughs> I, I mean hope I... I hope we're not keeping you up past your bedtime now. No, no, I will admit it's been a it's been a long day today. We had a very busy um oh gosh. We were doing we we did a couple of big events in, in the last few weeks and uh, it's a steep learning curve when we're, you know, putting food in a box. <laughs> yeah. It's it's brand new for sure. It is. But I will say the feedback, the feedback from the participants has been outstanding. They've been raving about everything since the soda bread. And I think the, the main course has been a big hit. I just put on my oven. Okay. So we're, we're, we're going to have a Mediterranean dinner tonight, a little late. So, uh, okay. but it used to be before there was children in this house, this would be a typical dining time in this house would be around 10 o'clock. So that all changes when, uh, when people are relying on you for sustenance. So looking forward to having uh having dinner but anyway let's talk about dessert oh well well um yeah so first of all i'm so enjoying listening to Aoife and tom and uh yeah i get kind of you know forget that i've got i'm up next for a course um and i also would like to ask Aoife if she would be kind enough to share her her grandmother's recipe for soda bread, <laughs> because I'm always always looking for the best recipe out there. Um, okay, so for dessert, we have made a chocolate Guinness cake, and we thought it would be fun to uh, play on a pint of Guinness. So when you got your cakes in little boxes, I hope you popped it into your fridge, um, because if you didn't, and you went to take the acetate off, uh, by the way, don't eat the acetate, You've got to take the acetate off the cake. Uh, it's a little trick we use in the business to uh, to stack things. So we um, we ice the top of the cake, and then we did, you know, we did a, a little uh, what what do you call it, Kevin? The, the the triptych, the circles of oh my gosh. Okay, it'll come back to me. Anyway, uh, so Owen, here's what happened when I uh, left my cake on the end of the counter. And it got very hot in the kitchen. I was listening to all the music and the great chat and it, it got a little soft, the icing. And I pulled the acetate off and it kind of, you know, pulled away with it, but that's okay. Chefs can fix anything and you can do the same in your kitchen. So you find the most outstanding cake stand in your cupboard and you distract everybody from the fact that your icing got a little messed up. And so that's what I've done. And uh, here's my little cake I'm going to do the, the big exposure here. Um, and, and there it is. You can see it does look like a pint of Guinness, though, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. And I, I like you said, like the uh, the sorcery and the visual distraction of your cloche there, the beautiful little crystal cloche with the bird on top, I think it was, distracts people from the fact that the mold may be I didn't hold it up in the warmth of the kitchen. <laughs> warmth the kitchen. So, you know, this, this stuff happens. So we, um, we don't care because we know it's going to taste delicious. So I'm going to take it off. Uh, I'm going to take it off of the cake stand, cut it in half, uh, because really at the end of the day, all you want to do is eat your cake, have your cake and eat it too. And there it is. So this, ca this cake does have... Uh, cocoa powder in it, but I did put actual dark 70% uh, Calibo chocolate in it because I thought, you know, I really wanted to kick out the the, uh, the chocolate. And um, another thing, you know, you see a lot of chefs doing, we like to, we like to dust. We just can't do enough of that. Uh, just a little bit. Yeah. You know, 
bit hard to see there on the plate because the light is not great. <laughs> it's not the food network, you know. No. <laughs> so there you go. You've got a nice big slab of cake. Uh, Kevin is drooling off in the corner. He can't wait to have his. Um, yeah, and and uh, and some good news. I, I was just going to ask. I was just going to ask. Is there any whiskey left for dessert? <laughs> So oh, perfect timing. There's a little, yeah, we'll have a little shot of the Glendalough uh, whiskey at the end of our cake and just sit back and enjoy some more, some more music and some great crack. And uh, yeah, I, this has been a lot of fun, really. It, it's, it, you know, you're in the kitchen all day and, and you're, you're cooking all these meals and then you come home and you're in your own kitchen. And uh, I, I will tell you that Kevin and I, love to entertain uh and when we first when we were we've been married 42 years now our kids are growing congratulations up. yeah thank you incredible <laughs> congratulations kevin um <laughs> but you know we always uh, we always had people in our our home our apartment our house wherever we lived and you know we could pile them up they could sit on the stairs and we also, in the early days when we started our first restaurant, Mildred Pierce, um, and we had a much smaller staff, we used to have a lot of parties in our home for our staff. And sometimes we had to ask them to leave at five o'clock in the morning, but um, that's okay. We were much younger then too. But our children grew up in a very um, hospitality-driven household. And uh, I, I find it very odd, the two of us come home, there's no one coming into our restaurant. We can't invite anybody in to dine with us. So tonight has been very special just to sit back. And I mean, I want to shout out to everybody because I know most of the people who, who have joined us for dinner tonight. And I hope you've had as much fun as we have. So thank you for including us. And thank you, Donna. And I can speak on behalf of everyone. And the feedback in the chat has been incredible. And like, it's no surprise because obviously, you know, you've been such an inspiration in our, in our industry. You've, uh, you're, you're uh, a real role model. And, uh, you know, like I said earlier, our industry has a lot of work to do um, and, and being able to participate with such a, an outstanding leader, but also a female chef is inspirational because, you know, people have this cliche of, you know, the angry white male chef. Um, and it's so important that we, we, encourage different people from a, every background to come into our industry and you've been such a role model and a leader in our industry and i know it's gonna you're gonna continue that uh, for many more years and and for those of you listening if you're in toronto mildred sample kitchen and liberty village is a wonderful place regardless of in-seat dining they're obviously still doing business like many of our independent restaurants um, and all our restaurants across Canada and around the world. It's important that if you can, please support these businesses because they're, they're really, uh, you know, working as hard as they possibly can. And they're such a heartbeat of our community. Um, and it's important that we try and support each other and, and these businesses as much as possible. And uh, I'm thinking of you, Donna. I'm, I can't wait to see you in person. I'll tell you that. And it's so great to see you and Kevin, even in two dimensions. But I, I hope that we can meet three very soon. So uh, enjoy, enjoy the rest of your night. Enjoy that Glendalough whiskey. Thank you for a wonderful meal. As soon as we're done, I'm going to have my entree and I'll, I'll be having a glass of something clear and brown and uh, with that wonderful looking chocolate cake later on. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to shout out to the Irish community here in Toronto. have been incredibly supportive to uh, my restaurant and many other restaurants out there. Uh, it's really appreciated uh, because, the, you know, we just we just couldn't survive without all of that support. So thank you from bottom of my heart, really. Here, here. Uh, thanks, Owen. All right, Donna, take care. We'll talk soon. All the best. Bye bye. Bye bye. So I, hope, I hope everyone's enjoying uh, a dessert. And uh, like Constance says, we're very excited to go back to Mildred's for brunch very soon. I mean, Donna is the queen of brunch here in Toronto. I'm going to wrap things up. I think we have another video of some jigs and we'll probably try and drag Tom and uh, Aoife back in and, and we'll, you know, stay on for a little bit. You know, maybe it'll be just the three of us by about midnight or 5 a.m. Aoife's time. So uh, we'll we'll play play it off with a couple of jigs here and then we'll uh, have a quick wrap up with Tom and Aoife at the very end.
fantastic set of jigs there, Aoife. Do you want to take us through what that, that last set was? Um, yeah, just two tunes called The Rolling Wave, possibly one of my favorite tunes. And then into a great piping tune called Strop the Razor, um, which I'm not going to explain. <laughs> I believe a strop was used for sharpening a razor blade back in the day, or it is still in, uh, in butchering and razors. It's strop the razor, I guess, means sharpen the razor blade. But there's, you know, and I'm sure it's the same in Newfoundland, there's some, you know, absolutely iconic uh, tune titles. Like uh, there's a few I can't I, even, there's a few I can't say on camera, but there's definitely some that really illustrate the, uh, the motive for writing the tune in the first place, shall I say. Well, I was either going to pick Strop the Razor or I buried my wife and danced on top of her. So, you know, I went for Strop the Razor. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll say what's interesting is that those two tunes, as soon as Aoife sent them to me to record, so if you couldn't tell, like I was in Toronto in the studio for, where we do Q and then Aoife was in, was in, in London. Um, those are two tunes that are played at, at every single Dora Keo session. Um, so they're really? kind of like, they're really big Toronto tunes. And and so is I buried my wife and dance on top of her. Like they're for what for whatever reason you picked two tunes that are standards of the Toronto uh, tune repertoire. Serendipity. I must. It must be my calling to go and play a few tunes in Toronto at some point in my life. <laughs> yeah. If only you make the effort, Eva. We. Uh, I'm sure we'd find a bed for you at some night. I'll get there. Don't worry, guys. It was on my to-do list before COVID hit. You know, it was. Yeah. It was on the way of happening, so it will happen. Hopefully, we have the opportunity to all get together indoors very, very soon. Um, I know we've, you know, just looking at the chat here, people have an incredible evening. I think Kevin's on his way to the washing up, and uh, Donna is getting a well-earned rest on the, on, hopefully, on the couch with her, her Guinness chocolate cake and her glass of Glendalough Irish whiskey. But uh, do you want to play a, another set there or two, Aoife, just to wrap things up? I know it's getting pretty late over in Salisbury. It's, uh, what is it, it's coming up 10 past two in the morning. Um, and I'm also cognizant of the fact that the uh, public service announcement for the Canadian-based folks is that the hours, the clocks spring forward tonight. So I don't. I want to make sure people are getting their full eight in tonight. But we, uh, I certainly think we've got time to wrap up with a couple of tunes before we go. So is there anything in particular you'd like to play? Um, well, seeing that Tom had a great story about the horse that may or may not have passed away, unfortunately, he didn't most, pass away. He didn't. I mean, pass the away. jury, the jury's out, Tom. You know, I'm gonna have to ask around and get a second opinion on that one. <laughs> um, it kind of brought to mind the fact that most Irish songs are terribly sad and don't have happy endings. So the jury's out in this one as well. It's called the Fox Chase. It's usually something that the pipes play. It's a virtuoso piece. And as my dad is an Ilum piper, as a child, I was disgusted that this was only for the pipes and not for the fiddle. So I made my own version for the fiddle. Um, it's a story of a fox being chased and hunted. Does he get away? Who knows? We'll never know. There is a lament for the fox, but I like to think of it as it's a lament for the fact that the fox managed to escape because nowhere is it written that he's actually killed. He yelps, he cries, but you know, I don't hear any kind of sudden ending. So the story goes that they go off with their march. It's the first tune. <laughs> horses start galloping, the dogs start going crazy. You hear the horns? And the dogs get more excited. That kind of stuff. The fox gets caught. He cries. There's a bit of a lament for him. And then there's a jig at the end. So the way I like to see it is that that's the, the fox jigging off home after outwitting the hunters. Do with it what you will. But that is my interpretation of the story, a bit like Tom and his horse. It sounds it's like called the fox, the fox is, chase, it sounds like the, the death of the fox. It sounds like the fox is going down the road alongside the horse, if you ask me. <laughs> I think you're maybe, right, maybe Tom. they're friends. <laughs> I, I think uh, I think you two will have to collaborate on a sequel that will be uh, broadcast live. It'll be debuted in Dora Kyo's some Sunday in the near future, hopefully. 
That would be a pleasure. I'm Emmy Lou. But yeah, so this is the fiddle version of the Fox Chase, and I hope you enjoy it. I won't I won't drag it out too long, but um just listen out for the jig at the end. It's definitely the fox getting home. Perfect. So That is excellent, Aoife. And I mean, a time that, you know, the fox hunt was a thing that was obviously, a, shall we say, a hangover from uh, from when our 
British cousins were in town and uh, it's something that is not not seen that often anymore in Ireland, but certainly would have been a big part, especially of the rural landscape and the rural the rural community over the years. That's excellent. So, yeah, Tom, we're going to give you the... What's that? I was going to say, it actually is still done in certain parts of the country, yeah. but they, they don't kill the fox. Yes. They let it yeah. go. So, so that's the same the as the horse. The same as the horse. The fox, uh, the fox gets away at the end. It's all it's all sport, I guess. Tom, Fantastic. we're gonna have that's it. We're gonna have you do the last rap as as the kind of the link. You're halfway halfway between uh, Toronto and Dublin. Um, so if there's a particular song that you think really kind of joins the dots or or sums up the I don't know, I'm putting you on the spot again. If there's something that joins the dots or, or sums up the unique relationship, the special relationship between the two regions, and um, if there's something you'd like to, to close off with just before we, we have a few closing words. Um, yeah, you know what? There actually might might be. I'm in Toronto, actually, at the moment. Um, no, I know that. I know. Yeah. But I'm just, uh, yeah. Being, being from Newfoundland, in fact, I have the soda bread and the salmon. I've been making Eva incredibly jealous. Uh, all night by telling her it's out in the fridge and just waiting for me. And I also wanted to point out to Donna, this is what I have uh, happening here. Tonight. Oh, so I'm, nice. I, it's, a, it's a good night here in, in Toronto yes. as well, you know. Um, you know what I could do? I could do something that is a pretty well-known song, like a bit of a pub song. But the reason I want to play it is because when I go to Ireland and it's sung, I'm always, you know, maybe a few points deep, reminding people at the bar that it was written by a Newfoundlander. One of the biggest pub, one of the biggest songs in, in, in Ireland was, was written by a Newfoundlander. And uh, I have been told, no it, no, it wasn't, so many times. I went back and told the, the late Ron Hines who wrote the song. Um, I said, Ron, you know, this happened to me. I went over to Ireland and people were singing Sonny's Dream, Sonny Don't Go Away. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I said, um, I told them that, you know, you wrote the song and they didn't believe me. He said, I went over there and I told them I, I wrote the song and they didn't believe me. <laughs> <laughs> so Ron actually, so this is the lovely connection. I wasn't going to, I was actually going to play another Ron song, but shag it, it's the end of the night, let's play it. Um, yeah. The... Uh, the song, so this is a perfect link because the song was written by a Newfoundlander. It's become a standard in Ireland and it was written in Toronto. Oh, wow. Sleeping That's in great. a sleeping bag in a van on the side of the road in I believe 1972. You checked um, all the boxes there. That's very impressive. And uh, this was, I guess, it really brought into the public consciousness by Christy Murr recorded a famous version of it in the in the late 80s and early 90s that uh one of ireland's greatest folk singers so that's a perfect way to end a great evening let's do it this is ron hines from fairyland newfoundland his song sunday's dream all right great take it away i don't know if i've ever sang this before but... sunny on the farm in a wide open space you can take off your sneakers and give up the reins you can lay down your head by a sweet river bed sunny always remembers what it was his mama said and she said sunny don't go away I am here all alone. Your daddy's a sailor who never comes home. And the nights get so long. And the silence goes on. And I'm feeling so tired. I'm not all that strong. And it's a hundred miles from town. Sonny's never there. He just goes to the highways and stands there and stares and he watches and sees in his room by the stairs and the waves keep on rolling. They've done that for years. Sonny, don't go away. I am here. Let's go. 
Top class, Tomas, top class. The the addition I'll make is any serious scholars of the song and people who know the Christy Moore version might have said to themselves, well, there's a verse at the end, Tom, that you left off where Sonny's mother dies and Sonny has to figure out life without her. Christy Moore added that verse, wrote that verse and added it. Ron heard it, got really, really upset and threatened to sue Christy about it. And one night he got a call from a man who I'm told may have been Christy Moore himself. He said, Ron, you got two options ahead of you. You can go to court or you can go to the bank. And Ron <laughs> chose the bank. And that, that song and recording of Christy ended up making his career. And, um, and we put a Newfoundland out of protest, of course, we always leave that last person. Yeah. <laughs> nothing, nothing like an Irish songwriter got a tragic ending to it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> like what I said earlier we just don't really do happy songs <laughs> no yeah there, there there is an element of us uh, reveling in misery or our begrudgery as it's known in Ireland like uh, we're we're happiest when we're at our, our most miserable sometimes anyway it's been an incredible evening obviously we spoke earlier in the week and uh, we were wondering how this was going to work out but judging by the feedback in the chat i think people had a wonderful evening uh, i'd just like to say a, a massive massive gura mila mila mahagat to you both uh, tom in toronto and Aoife in in the uk i think you're well past your bedtime um chef donna a fantastic meal i think my my dinner is about three minutes away, so I'm looking forward to that. I'll pour myself a glass of wine, and then I'll, I'll try and find some Irish whiskey. I'm sure there's some in this house somewhere. Um, really, really incredible evening. Thanks to Robert uh, and William and all the board members at Arden Park, or as it's now known, the Canada Arden Foundation, as of this evening. Um, it does amazing work, not just in the city of Toronto, but also across uh, Canada, I know it's it's scope and it's uh, the work that they will do would only expand. We're not this is not the end. It's only the beginning of the next chapter, um, and it's it's something that we've learned uh, being an expat. And I know many of you here tonight are, you know, we we I never realized the impact that the Irish community made on the city of Toronto on the country of Canada. You know, when we grow up, we associate our our diaspora with uh, you know the likes of Boston and Chicago and Melbourne and Sydney and those cities. Um, but really the impact that Irish people have made in this country over the last couple of hundred years and, and you know, all the other nations that have come here to, to call it home is truly incredible. And the Canada Art and Foundation does such a, a great job of, of highlighting that and also continuing the good work that like the likes of Dr. Grasset and these people that really carved out a life here back in the day uh, started out. So I'd really like to thank the foundation, the board. Um, and, and all the people that supported this event tonight. I know we want to be in person together. I know it's a busy month and uh, thanks to 
to James and his colleagues in the in Ottawa, you know, it's officially Irish Heritage Month now in Canada is a month of March, and um, hopefully we can get back to our in person in person gatherings very soon, and that uh, March 2022 will be the usual schedule of Ireland Fun Luncheon and uh, Person of the Year and St Patrick's Day Parade and Canada Ireland events uh, and this, and all those things. So. Both of you, thank you so much. I look forward to knocking a tune or three out and maybe a pint or two or four even um, indoors or somewhere else very soon. It's great to see you both and, and please keep in touch. Thanks for your time this evening. Uh, William, Robert, all the board members, it's, it's been an incredible evening and uh, thanks for, thankfully, finally, uh, for, for inviting me to be a part of it. I hope I, I hope it did it justice because... Uh, you know, it's great to share a screen with such incredible talent and Tom and Aoife, and I'm really, really delighted to support it in any way that I can. And the last thing I will say is that it's hard to believe that it's been 12 months since this all started, and uh, we've been stuck in our rooms and stuck in our houses and stuck in our routines, and it's very important that we look out for each other. So if there's someone that you're thinking of tonight, or tomorrow that you haven't spoken to in a while or, or you're yourself are feeling down, pick up that phone and reach out to people because uh, you're never alone. Even if you think you are, you're just a text message or a phone call or a, an I am away from reaching out to someone. I could really make a difference to someone, uh, especially in these difficult times that we're finding ourselves in. So to wrap it up, Svan agus banacht, gyrra mila mila magoth a cardi galair agus Svan agus banacht and we'll see you very soon. Take care, thank you and all the best. Good night.